800 passenger capacity, a double deck cabin, and a massive frame, the Airbus A380 was the largest passenger aircraft to ever take to the skies, but America never wanted it. No orders, no trial runs, zero interest, zero acceptance. But why? Was it really that bad? Or was it just too much? To understand the reason, we need to look beyond the aircraft itself. We need to examine the American aviation model. This video doesn't just explain why the A380 failed, it also explores why the US market has always been closed to giants of the sky. The Airbus A380 was designed in the late 1990s with a very clear goal, to create a massive hub-to-hub -hub system connecting the world's busiest air traffic centers. Airbus envisioned a future where thousands of passengers would travel daily between mega airports like London Heathrow, Frankfurt, Singapore, and Dubai. And the most efficient way to move them was with one aircraft carrying as many people as possible. That's why the A380 was big, very big. But there was a flaw in that vision. The United States didn't fit this model at all. Unlike Europe, the US aviation system isn't built around a single central hub. It's a multi-hub network – Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, Miami. Each region has its own major airport, and travelers prefer frequent, direct flights over massive transfers. Airbus's revolutionary dream may have worked for Europe and Asia, but for America, this giant aircraft was a product of the wrong time and the wrong market. And that was just the beginning. Because US airlines saying no to the A380 wasn't just a strategic decision, it was also an operational impossibility. When Airbus launched the A380, it was hopeful. Gulf carriers were flooding in with orders and the Asian market showed massive interest. But from the United States, the world's largest aviation market, not a single order came. Why? Because US airlines rejected the A380's very concept from day one. Delta Airlines' former VP of Operations, Steve Dixon, put it bluntly, the A380 doesn't fit our network. United Airlines' former CFO, John Rainey, had a more strategic view. It's more efficient to operate several wide-body flights than to try filling up one A380. American Airlines believed demand in the US wasn't strong enough to keep such a massive aircraft full. Flying 500 people from one city to another in a single flight, it's just not that easy in America. All three carriers shared the same view. The A380 was too big, too clumsy, too risky. It's not enough to fill a plane once, you have to fill it every day on every flight. And US airlines aren't in the business of taking romantic risks. To them, every route is a math problem, and the A380 was the variable that never quite solved. The A380's massive frame naturally required four engines. But that size came with two major problems, fuel consumption and maintenance costs. For years, US airlines have been shifting their fleets toward more efficient twin-engine aircraft. Models like the Boeing 777, 787 Dreamliner, Airbus A330, and A350 can all fly long-haul routes with two engines, and they burn 20-30% to 30 less fuel compared to the A380. And it's not just about fuel. Four engines mean twice the maintenance, twice the risk of failure, and twice the spare parts. Especially in the US domestic system, a plane sitting on the ground is a plane losing money. That's why simplicity and operational reliability are critical for American carriers. The A380, as much as it was an engineering marvel, was carrying the wrong weapon into the war for efficiency. America's response was clear, more engines mean more problems. And because of that, the A380 was eliminated from the balance sheets before it ever touched a US runway. The philosophy behind the Airbus A380 was crystal clear – fewer flights, more passengers. In other words, lower frequency, higher capacity. And that made perfect sense in centralized aviation systems like those in Europe and Asia.
At airports like Heathrow, getting a slot was difficult, so the more people you could carry per flight, the more efficient the operation became. But that's not how things work in America. The U.S. operates the world's most advanced multi-hub system. Airports like New York and Chicago, along with nearly every major U.S. airport, serve as regional hubs, and many of them function as international gateways on their own. So traffic isn't funneled into a single central hub. Most Americans prefer to avoid layovers, and airlines respond by offering a high number of direct flights. Take the New York to Los Angeles route, for example. American Airlines, Delta, and JetBlue operate dozens of flights every day. Why? Because they want to give passengers flexibility. Some want to fly in the morning, others in the afternoon, and some at night. Now imagine putting an A380 on that same route, only one or two flights per day, but with 800 seats to fill. What if it doesn't sell out? What if there's a belay? What if the return flight is late? The whole system could jam. Instead, U.S. airlines prefer more frequent, more flexible flights. For example, six to seven flights per day using a Boeing 737 MAX or a comfortable yet smaller cabin with an A321LR. And here's the key. This strategy makes more money. Even when the A380 is full, its operating costs are so high that flying two to three smaller jets on the same route can be more profitable. That's why American Airlines stuck to their efficiency formula. More flights, not more seats, wins. And the A380 simply didn't fit that logic. Sure, there were routes it could fly, but in the American business model, it never had a place. The A380 never made it into the fleet of any U.S. airline. But that doesn't mean the aircraft couldn't technically operate on any U.S. route. In fact, if the A380 were ever to fly a domestic route in America, one route stands out above the rest, New York to Los Angeles. It's one of the busiest and most competitive routes in the U.S., carrying over 3 million passengers annually. And most importantly, both JFK and LAX airports are fully equipped to handle A380 operations. Emirates already flies the A380 between them, but internationally. So yes, the infrastructure was there, passenger demand was high, and the flight time, around 6 hours, fell within the lower range of the A380's long-haul efficiency window. So why didn't it happen? Because the aircraft types and business models used on this route are completely at odds with the A380's nature. Let's take a quick look at who flies this route and with what aircraft. American Airlines uses a specially configured Airbus A321T offering three cabins, first, business and economy, complete with live flat seats, Wi-Fi and premium service. Delta operates multiple daily flights using both 757-200s and 767-300-400s, some featuring the Delta One premium cabin. JetBlue flies the ultra-modern A321LR with its Mint class product, a cabin so premium it rivals some international business class services. United and Alaska Airlines run this route with fuel-efficient narrowbodies like the 737-900ER and 737 MAX 9. The strategy here is clear. Fly often, stay flexible, attract premium passengers, and maximize efficiency. In that system, the A380 feels out of place. Flying it twice a day on this route would pose serious operational risks. Even at full capacity, every turnaround, from gate to baggage to boarding, would be slower and more expensive. So while this route was theoretically a fit for the A380, in practice, it clashed with the core of the US airline model. The result? The A380 could have flown this route, but it never did. When most people think of the A380, they picture a two-deck giant made for passengers. But Airbus had bigger plans. In the early 2000s, it introduced a cargo variant of the aircraft, the Airbus A380F. And this version initially caught the attention of America's logistics giants. Companies like FedEx and UPS were impressed by the A380F's payload capacity. It promised to carry freight volumes far beyond what existing cargo planes could handle and to do it with fewer flights. FedEx placed an order for 10 A380Fs. UPS followed with a similar deal for another 10 aircraft. Airbus believed the cargo version could give it a foothold in the US market, perhaps even before the passenger model took off. But that dream didn't last long. Like the passenger version, the A380F faced serious development delays. 
Airbus had to focus all its engineering efforts on certifying the passenger variant, and the freighter was quietly pushed to the background. For FedEx and UPS, time was money, and during that delay, Boeing introduced the 747-8F, a more efficient and immediately available cargo aircraft. It offered greater operational flexibility and, crucially, didn't come with the same scale-related limitations. The result? FedEx cancelled its order in 2006, UPS followed in 2007. With both orders gone, the A380F's American dream was officially dead. Airbus never put the freighter into production. The project was shelved and Airbus quietly exited its plans for the large freighter market. And with that, the only real bridge between the A380 and the US was gone. It wasn't just a few cancellations, it was Airbus's best chance at entering the American market. But just like its passenger sibling, the A380F failed to fit into the American system. By now, you probably understand why US airlines were so reluctant to embrace the A380. But the issue wasn't just about wanting the aircraft, you also had to redesign your airport around it. When Airbus introduced the A380, the message to the world was clear. This aircraft is built for the future of air traffic. Airports need to evolve accordingly. And in fact, some American airports did evolve. Los Angeles was equipped with A380-specific jet bridges, wider apron space, and dual-level passenger gates. New York, San Francisco, and Miami all upgraded their infrastructure to support A380 operations. Even massive hubs like Atlanta extended runways and widened taxiways to accommodate the aircraft when needed. So no, infrastructure wasn't an obstacle, at least not at the major airports. But the A380's problem wasn't just about airport design. The real issue was how many airports could actually use that infrastructure. Instead of flying wide bodies on a handful of routes, US airlines preferred to offer greater flexibility with many more narrow body flights. And if the A380 could only fly between JFK and LX, what were they supposed to do with it on all the other routes? For Gulf carriers, this wasn't an issue. Airlines like Emirates, Etihad, and Qatar operate around a centralized hub model, flying the A380 on the same long-haul routes every day. But carriers like Delta and United didn't want to deploy the aircraft on just a few select routes. And retrofitting every airport to handle the A380 would have cost millions of dollars. That kind of investment only makes sense if the aircraft is flying at high capacity and used frequently. So yes, infrastructure was necessary, but even where it existed, the A380 couldn't fit into the rest of the system. For Airbus, the A380 was an engineering triumph, but for the US airline industry, it was little more than an expensive luxury that didn't fit the model. It would be easy to explain why no US airline chose the A380 purely through technical or operational reasons. But behind the scenes, there was a deeper dynamic at play. Boeing's industry influence, and America's instinct to protect its own manufacturers. The U.S. aviation industry isn't just the largest in the world, it's also one of the most protectionist. Especially in civil aviation, the Buy American principle is almost an unwritten rule. Boeing is not just an aircraft manufacturer. It's a massive institution, deeply intertwined with the defense industry, employing thousands and wielding strong lobbying power in Washington, D.C. American Airlines have long-standing commercial ties with Boeing. Aircraft purchases, maintenance contracts, pilot training infrastructure, spare parts supply chains, the entire system is built around Boeing, not Airbus. So even if Airbus wanted to break into the US market with a large aircraft like the A3080, it would first have to break through that invisible wall, and that was no easy task. In fact, even Airbus's smaller, long-haul models like the A330 and A3050 only saw limited adoption in the US during the 2000s. With few exceptions like JetBlue, European-built planes have always played a secondary role in America. The launch of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner completely shut the door on the A3080's chances. The 787 could fly long-haul routes with just two engines, was smaller, more efficient, and perfectly suited for the US multi-hub system, everything the A3080 was not. And let's not forget, the Boeing 747 was a symbol of American aviation. 
the Airbus A380 in many ways looked like it was trying to take that crown, but the US had no intention of giving it up. So in the end, the A380 didn't just fail commercially in the US, it failed culturally and strategically as well. The A380 was a technical marvel, with its double-deck design, quiet cabin, 800-passenger capacity, and sky-dominating presence, it left a lasting mark on aviation history. But U.S. airlines never opened their doors to this giant. Throughout this video, we explored why. Operational inefficiency, high operating costs, incompatibility with the U.S. route network, the economic drawbacks of a four-engine design, and the overwhelming influence of Boeing in the American market. But what we should take away from this story isn't just a question, why didn't it happen? The real takeaway is what the A380 taught the US airline industry. Because the A380 wasn't just a project for Airbus, it was an attempt to change the paradigm, a bold effort to reshape the future of aviation around bigger, stronger jets that carried more passengers per flight. But America was playing a different game. By rejecting the A380, US carriers were making a clear statement. We don't profit from fewer, massive flights. We profit from more frequent, more flexible, and more efficient ones. And this approach didn't just win financially. It also won in terms of the passenger experience. Rather than flying one A380 once a day, operating three or four smaller aircraft on the same route spreads out capacity and gives travelers more choices. This strategy still forms the foundation of U.S. aviation today. And the A380's failure to fit into that system wasn't a failure of the aircraft, it was a case of fundamental mismatch. Airbus wanted to spark a revolution with the A380, but America didn't want a revolution. It wanted steady, disciplined, cost-effective growth. Today, the A380 is no longer in production, but the legacy it leaves behind is still being debated. And the US saying no to this massive aircraft continues to shape the future of aviation. Because at the end of the day, one thing is clear, the biggest plane isn't always the right plane. If you'd like to see more videos like this, make sure to like and subscribe. See you at 40,000 feet.